week after week, there would be a black carbon deposit from the filament on the inside of the bulb, which of course would make the light get dimmer and dimmer. This was not good, right? So, um, so Edison looked at this and he said, well, you know, I think electrons go from, uh, in his case, from the filament to a plate. He put a plate inside the bulb to draw off the electrons. He didn't really know why, but it did, and, and thus the bulb could, would, would not necessarily carbon up. And, um, but he used the plate. Um, he measured, he used it as a, a measurement of, of current flow. Um, it was the beginning early theory of thermionic emission. Well, he put it aside. He patented it. He called it the Edison effect. He put it aside. Well, here's Ambrose Fleming. Fleming worked for Edison. Fleming was uh, in the UK, running Edison in the UK. Uh, and then he went to work for Marconi at the beginning of the century. And so <coughs> Fleming's uh, interest, because he had to work for a living, he had to do what Marconi said. And Marconi, Marconi was in the business of Morse code, two-way communication, nothing else. He didn't want radio or audio or music. He wanted code. And so Fleming uh, got a patent for a diode vacuum tube. Um, a rectifier, but using it as a detector of wireless signals, he got this in 1905. Now Fleming's uh, tube, and you can see the little red square there, um, when, when it detects the, the presence of a dot or a dash, it makes a meter called a galvanometer move from one, one point to the other. I, I've not, not really seen one. I know we have a galvanometer up here somewhere, but, but uh, this is what Fleming's thing did because Fleming work for Marconi. And this was a detector of Morse code, the on or off of the dots and dashes. Well, Fleming um, could not go much farther. He might have. You know, we can always say, well, maybe Edison would have invented the vacuum too. Maybe Fleming would have if he hadn't had to work for a guy that only cared about Morse code. Well, DeForest came along, and I have a letter um, in, in the book uh, Quoting DeForest, he writes to his attorney and says, you know, get me that Fleming patent because DeForest wanted to look at it carefully. Well, what he did a year later, uh, and he also did this for wireless telegraph because he had not yet started uh, the process of working on, on uh, voice transmission, radio telephone. What DeForest did was take the same Fleming tube and he added headphones and a second battery or a B battery from the plate there, there's the battery, the headphones, uh, back to the, um, back to the, the cathode or the, the filament, and this allowed the dots and dashes to be heard in earphones. Well, what's the significance of that? The significance of that is that as soon as uh, voice transmission was available, you'd be able to hear it. You couldn't hear it with Fleming's device, so what DeForest really did was very significant. It's very small, and if you read any patent, it always says, I have found a new and useful or a new and different uh, use for something. And so he, uh, by adding the B battery in the earphone, and then eventually adding the third element, which, which we know as the grid to make the three element tube, was able to make something that, that went past, went beyond Edison and went beyond Fleming. I mean, they all had a purpose, but as you'll see in my book, and as you probably know because you're electronics-oriented uh, people, that, that every inventor Steve Jobs included, looks at what came before and says, how can I improve this and make it a consumer experience? Or how can I sell more of these? How can I do a patent that will, that will bypass uh, the courts you know, and won't get sued for it? So every inventor does that. So I talk about that in the book. Um, DeForest was significant in radio. He was uh, an early radio broadcaster. The newspaper record, this article in the Times, uh, was March 1907. It talks about DeForest broadcasting music to the Times Tower. And this is a uh, 1907 um, photograph. You see, again, uh, every device that was invented always used the previous device as a model. So DeForest, for a radio telephone, used the telephone transmitter, carbon microphone. This is how they did it. Uh, there's a phonograph, and it looks like attached to the back of the phonograph is some sort of carbon microphone acoustic coupler to, to send uh, record music. And then there's a, uh, an arc. He used an arc transmitter. The interesting thing about this is, um, and it was quoted in this uh, March 8th, 07 article, he said, Dr. DeForest began experimenting with his present apparatus last December. Well, what does that mean? Who else was experimenting with the radio telephone? Fessenden, Fessenden the, the famous Fessenden 1906 Christmas Eve broadcast. The problem with Fessenden, and this is where DeForest 
kind of overwhelms every inventor because he always courted the press. Fessenden hated the press. He was a crotchety guy, if you can believe that. Um, and Fessenden, and again, here is how do we know what we know? To answer that question again, how do we know that Fessenden did the Christmas Eve broadcast in 1906? Well, Fessenden said so, but not until 1930 in his autobiography. And so some recent scientists, there was a big article by uh, Mr. O'Neill in Radio World, <coughs> Uh, a couple of other articles, AWA Journal article a few years ago saying that I searched everywhere and I cannot find, this is what the author said, the researchers, cannot find any information in the press about Fessenden Christmas Eve broadcast. All we know is what Fessenden told us. Now it probably happened because he had the device and he was doing it uh, earlier in the month apparently, but just the idea that, um, you know, Here's something that was 100 years old, and if you don't leave a record, well, yeah, there you go. Well, I grew okay. up in the next town from Marshfield. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, he did that at Grant Rock, which right. part of the town of Marshfield. But he did something now, else earlier, which, which I do have in the book. I have a, a Fessenden, some Fessenden stuff in the book, and I have the uh, Fessenden uh, researcher, Bell Rose, up in Canada, who kind of point counterpoint with uh, some of the other researchers. There's a lot of detail in the book. It's ridiculously big. Um, DeForest uh, also um, used uh, a radio telephone using an arc uh, while he was using his audio on as a receiver. Uh, later on, by 1916, 17, he was using his vacuum tube oscillion as a, uh, as a transmitter of radio. So he was early in radio. Well, let's look at the locally because the 1912 in Palo Alto is really important for DeForest because he developed his tube to amplify and to oscillate. Remember, three things, detector, amplify, and transmit, or oscillate. Federal Telegraph um, was the first Silicon Valley startup. Some Stanford professors um, financed uh, Cyril Elwell. Um, first, he tried to, to look at the McCarty patents in San Francisco, Spark Gap, and said, this is too crude, we can't use it. He ended up buying the Polson patents for high, high power, really high power international code using uh, Polson Arc. We even have those at Parent Foundation, giant, big arcs. Um, but this was found, founded and funded by Stanford professors. And Elwell, like DeForest, DeForest was out of money as always around that time. And Elwell said, come here, we'll give you a lab, we'll give you assistance, you can do whatever you want. Which is really kind of the way Silicon Valley is today. You know, if someone's a superstar, they'll give them space. And, you know, hopefully there's, there was an agreement that would, he would get something out of it. But this is what happened. Um, for DeForest. Now, sadly, uh, as soon as DeForest got there, he was arrested uh, for one of the, probably the second or third time. Um, and th this was written in his, he wrote this in his diary, March 29th, 1912. And he was arrested based on stock fraud for exaggerating the value of the audio. And I have all the court transcripts in the book. The prosecutor said, well, it's not even a good light bulb. Right. <laughs> so, 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 uh, obviously, so anyway, the, in the trial, which, which I talk about in the, wow. in the book, um, a couple of DeForest business partners were put in jail. DeForest was exonerated, as he always was. He was, he was accused, but he was never convicted. But anyway, what he said, just to give you an idea of, of partly the arrogance and partly DeForest the scientist, let me just read this. Um, since Wednesday, I have worried about what my arrest will cause my dear ones and about its outcome to me. Being guiltless, I fear not the outcome, only the heavy uh, and renewed expense and the sense of the rank injustice of it all. I will probably fight it out here, then go back east for a long time, but here is my work, my income especially during the coming summers when static problems must be solved. So, you know, here's DeForest rambling in his diary. Ah, oh, they're screwing me again, arresting me. It's not right. But, you know, what I really have to do is be a scientist. So this is interesting. His, throughout his diary, there are, there are, you know, some racist comments, anti-Semitic comments, uh, warm comments toward his family. There's a lot. And, and when you read hundreds of pages of this stuff, you, you kind of, you probably can't read it now, but after a while you begin to click in and you realize it takes a while. But I transcribed all of these into type, um, and, and um, I used them you know, throughout. Uh, anyway, it wasn't even a good light bulb, right? <laughs> While DeForest was in New York um, getting married to, to his second or 
third, to his third wife, um, <laughs> before he came back to Palo Alto and during the trial time, he had, while in Palo Alto, demonstrated his audion to AT&T. They needed desperately a way to do transcontinental phone calls, that is from San Francisco to New York back then, and uh, the ordinary telephone repeaters would not do it, and they thought, well, this audion is probably ideal. DeForest demonstrated it, crude as it was, filled with gas instead of uh, vacuum as it was, um, and uh, they didn't do anything. AT&T found out DeForest was hungry, and so they let him sweat for about a year. Then they brought in some attorney who said, uh, I represent somebody, I can't tell you who I represent. Uh, I'm authorized to give you, I think it was $50,000 for the rights for a long distance telephony. Uh, and he was hungry, so he took it. Uh, found out later it was uh, it was a scam by AT&T. So, you know, DeForest may have been a little on the dishonest side, but so was AT&T in that case. You know, they, they actually um, uh, tried to do that. So anyway, AT&T uh, does this. They demonstrate this in 1915 at the Pacific Panama International Exhibition in San Francisco, known as the PPIE. Um, DeForest also does an exhibit at the PPIE. His is really his transmitters and receivers and the radios he's now making using his audio. Um, DeForest drops in at the AT&T booth and they have a brochure called The Story of a Great Achievement Telephone communication from coast to coast. They talk about Alexander Graham Bell. They talk about the uh, capitalists at AT&T. What they don't mention at all is the name DeForest. When they just bought the patent from him uh, at a price he thought was not fair. So DeForest, being the kind of promo promotion guy he is, uh, went to the local printer and overnight he came back with a copy. We have both of these in History San Jose. He called it, of course, the same thing, story of a great achievement, and it, it's DeForest instead of Alexander. <laughs> he talks about it in a scientific way because, again, whatever else you think of DeForest, he was a real physicist, a real, a real scientist. Um, anyway, his version, we have them both um, at History San Jose. In interesting uh, kind of thing here. Um, Okay, uh, one final thing about the local league, as you probably know, and you will, you will know more about this in the, another book we're going to have for, here at CHRS, John Schneider's uh, History of Bay Area Radio, which we'll be uh, selling to you uh, when it comes out March, April, May, or thereabouts. Uh, broad, he set up a broadcast station using a, um, uh, an amateur experimental call, 6XC, in the California theater. I read it in his diary in January 1920, um, California Theater radio phone is in pretty good shape, antenna on Humboldt Tower is not ideal, but the music has been heard 1,200 miles out to sea. So he was using, uh, as you can see, his uh, oscillion um, tubes in, in this device. Now, uh, the significant thing about this, even though this never became a licensed station, was that this was the beginning of the year where KDKA would be licensed toward the end of the year in November and be that first commercially licensed station. Um, but many people, uh, well not many, but a number of people were already broadcasting. Um, I think Charles Harold had a, had a 6XE uh, or something like that call for his experiment. So, so there were people doing this sort of thing. Obviously the audience was, was almost all entirely amateurs. Okay, uh, part two of how the inventor invents. DeForest's claim to fame was that he put um, a variable density soundtrack beside the film so it would always remain in synchronization. And basically what we're saying is, you know, the actor speaks into a microphone, it's amplified, and the light vibrates in time with the voice. It is focused through a tiny slit, through uh, optics onto a slit, and then it uh, exposes the film along with the picture. It's a very crude version of it, I'm, I'm telling you. There's more, obviously, the book does it great detail, um, but, but it, it allows uh, sound to be on the film for the very first time. And so DeForest was not necessarily first doing sound movies, but um, I'll, I'll, in a minute I'll tell you why he probably did it right. Uh, this also brings up the DeForest way, which he did with everything he did. He, from an idea, he would get a patent, he would put it into practice, he would promote it, and he would 
try to profit from it. Of course, he never did, because he wasn't very good at that sort of thing. Okay, so um, what DeForest did, like all scientists, he said, well, you know, if I'm going to invent something, I have to identify what the problems are. In other words, this is like the literature search that any scientist or writer does. You try to find out what else has worked and not worked, read about it, and then you synthesize all that information, and maybe you come up with some kind of a solution. Well, the solution to sound on film was obvious. Prior to DeForest getting into it uh, in the late teens, um, the carbon telephone microphone was the only microphone existing. It evolved out of the telephone, and because there weren't radio stations on the air then, uh, you really didn't need anything better, although there would be, but right then it was a carbon microphone. And they're not very sensitive, and so if you're recording an actor speaking, the actor would have to be really close to the microphone, otherwise exponentially it would, it would uh, be really soft as you got farther and farther away. So it was no good. Quality wasn't too good. It was okay for the telephone. It was fine for the radio telephone and the early experiments. The other problem, headphones for listening. All, any uh, early sound on film experiment before DeForest used uh, the very insensitive selenium cell, which, which only could be heard with earphones. And that, of course, was because the audion had not been made to amplify. That's why DeForest really, that was a big thing he wrote, that audion, because it, it did so much for the media that we, we know today. So all the pre-DeForest sound films either used a phonograph or a selenium cell. Uh, Edison and Dixon experimented in uh, 1894, uh, recording the sound along with the picture. This, the picture was on a film, Edison, early Edison film. Edison was one of the first filmmakers, you know. Um, and, and the sound was on a cylinder. Now, synchronization would have been a problem because even though you could have a horn speaker which would allow an audience to hear sound on film, uh, Edison tried several times putting the, the um, speaker behind the screen and running some sort of, uh, of a belt, mechanical belt, between the screen and the projection booth, and obviously it was labor intensive. It never worked. Um, Eugene Laust in 1912, about the time Edison tried uh, his last phonograph experiment, uh, Laust put sound on film, but again the selenium cell, and so it was, it was theoretical. You'd hear it on the earphone, but it would not work, it would not change Hollywood uh, filmmaking. So, um, and DeForest always said, he, he wrote in his diary many times, the limitation of the phonograph, three to five minutes on the side, uh, never would be good for sound on film. He even tried a wire recorder, he tried a Polson tetragrammophone, whatever that thing is, it's in the book. Telegraph. Um, telegraph, yeah. He tried one of those in 1913 in an experiment in New York at RKO to try to uh, synchronize because he wanted longer playing time for music as well as for uh, film. So, DeForest gets this idea, he writes it down in October uh, 1918 uh, on the back of a, a piece of paper while on a cruise on a ship. He writes down what actually is the entire sound on film. It has not been improved upon. I mean, it's, you know, technical increments, of course, but what he basically says here, he <coughs> says three minutes, three methods for photographing sound film, sound on film uh, for talking motion pictures. A, use the speaking flame, which he began using uh, some sort of gas. You know, imagine the nitrate film back there. I'm sure he had some big surprises in the lab, but, but anyway, he used the speaking flame. Uh, second, very short, fine filament incandescent. Well, we know from the science of the time that uh, a flame was much faster um, and, and there was a lag with the incandescent filament. And so this is why mm -hmm. it was not satisfactory. The third method, a glow tube light filled with gas, uh, he says hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, it's oxygen, and so on and so forth. Um, this was what eventually would end up to be uh, the light that would write the, um, the actual uh, sound on the film. But here is where DeForest shines. Unlike Laos and all these people before, DeForest pops in a triode. Hey, there we go. So from the uh, from whatever the microphone is here, we go through uh, uh, out of the plate and through some sort of inductance here to the light, which he says fine slit, moving film, focused and variable density soundtrack. Now, this is really more theory than, than working model because he tried several years to make it good enough that he could show an audience, but it, it worked. But of course, and DeForest always admitted this, he read about Ernst Rumer in the 19th century who developed the photograph phone using an arc to write the sound on film. Again, 
uh, rumors playback was the um, was the selenium cell in earphones. So it wasn't practical, but it showed that it could be done. And also uh, there was Bell, Alexander Graham Bell and his uh, brother Chichester Bell and uh, somebody else. It's in the book. They they did uh, the phonograph phone uh, sending uh, signaling by light. So using the selenium cell. So anyway, it 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 was not. DeForest didn't just wake up and say, "I'm going to do this," but he took various bits and pieces from stuff he knew and created this piece of paper which led to less than a year later filing in 1919 this patent for sound on film which again says everything it probably would not have worked satisfactorily but he basically says everything to reproduce talking moving pictures from a single roll of film he says I have found a certain new you new and useful invention for means of recording and reproducing sound. So this is, uh, you know, he had two motives. He wanted to do sound on film, but he thought film is <coughs> a good way to have full-length operas, and I could listen to them play back in my home. I wouldn't have to keep turning over the stupid 78s from, uh, from side to side. Anyway, we know that the 1918 drawing was accurate because his fully formed patent, which he filed less than a year later, um, confirms that he put it to, uh, to patent what he was really doing. Um, again, writing and reproducing sound using light. He was covered by the press in coast to coast and around the world. On August 23, 1920, here's what he says. He, he succeeded. He says, On this day I made a photographic voice record on film with talking flame, which actually uh, spoke to me um, the words which I had forgotten were there, one, two, three, four, five, six, August the 23rd, this was 1920. So he believed he had that scientific breakthrough after all this experiment. I mean, the, his, his diary, as you'll see, and I've used a lot of it in the book, uh, shows the painful process of invention. You just don't say, here it is. <laughs> but you see, it takes a long time to do it. And basically, we're writing and playing back. The actor speaks into the microphone, which is amplified, which makes the light flicker analogous to the, to the audio, um, and, and it's uh, exposed onto film. It's one of many processes, uh, this being uh, variable density. Uh, really, the RCA photophone variable area ended up taking over uh, what was used in the, in the 1930s uh, after a few tries with this. DeForest was very, he was very good at putting on a white laboratory coat and sort of set dressing his laboratory and inviting the press to come in. He, he got some great interviews uh, and I've, I've used bits and pieces of them in the book but um, the press loved him because he was always out there and willing to talk to the men and women of the press. And uh, again, having publicity is one thing that DeForest thought would get him uh, not only reputation, but also would allow him to maybe attract uh, people to buy his uh, worthless stock. But, but he, was very, he was very good at promoting. Um, he wrote a series of articles and presentations in the Society of Motion Picture um, Engineers, now SMPTE in the 1920s, of all of the articles on sound film in the 1920s, there were six of them um, uh, between 1920 and 1927, DeForest wrote like four of the six or five of the six. So he was there. He was in front of scientific organizations. He wrote an article in Scientific American about this, the National Education Association about using sound film in education. He, he was always thinking. I mean, he was uh, manic, you know. He, he was definitely an interesting guy. The DeForest way, um, he uh, developed, he started the Phono Film Company in 1923 and sold stock. It was not successful. Um, he had a um, Phono Film UK operation, and the head of that, uh, running, running it for DeForest, was Cyril Elwell, DeForest's old boss back at Federal. So DeForest kind of paid him back, you know, and, and took care of him. DeForest, DeForest while, while scientists well, some scientists loathe DeForest, and, and, and many people, technical people do. There's one group, and you may be, all be a part of this, there's one group that loved DeForest to the end, and those were the ham radio operators. He called them, they called themselves the DeForest Pioneers, and they had uh, annual meetings, and you know, this was a big deal, the ham wireless pioneers, DeForest wireless pioneers. Okay, um, but DeForest did not do the sound on film process by himself even though he understood how it had to work. He heard about a man 
uh, Theodore Case, who lived in Auburn, New York, who fortunately for DeForest was a fellow Yale alum. Case was a smart guy, got his BA from uh, Yale and went to Harvard Law for a few years uh, from a rich family, but dropped out because he wanted to be an inventor. Um, and what he invented that was significant was he invented a photocell called his stalified cell during World War I, which allowed uh, communication between ships, but not on the visible wavelength. They used uh, a light that was above or below the, what you could see, and this, this photocell um, actually, you know, obviously started with slain so after the photocell actually amplified the light and, and allowed this kind of signaling. So this is what Case was doing. This is his laboratory as it was last summer, or, or a year and a half ago. Uh, Case um, uh, owned about half of Auburn, New York, uh, his the fancy mansions and everything, but they preserved it all. They gave it as a museum, it's being run as the Case Museum, and it has some interesting things in it, including um, the other side of the story between DeForest and Case. And anyway, that's his lab as he walked away from it uh, before 1930. What Case did <clears throat> was he supplied the photo cell, which he called the thalified cell, and they've got boxes of them there at the Case Museum, and also the, uh, the light that converts sound into light to record the light on the film. He called it his AEO light, standing for alkaline earth oxide. So it, again, gas-filled tubes with filaments and uh, amplified. Um, this is how it started in 1920. DeForest writes to Case saying, I understand you're producing a very sensitive photo cell. Um, <clears throat> so De DeForest was checking uh, vendors. Case actually wrote back and says, yes, we'll, we'll make sure you get one, but we want to order some condensers and resistors and things like that, some coils. So, so they, they started out ordering things from each other, but their relationship as it evolved through the 1920s was almost all science. Yes, Case was upset at DeForest for not paying his bills on time, um, but they mostly talked about science. You know, here's, here's something from the amplifier going through the primary, the output of the plate to the primary, the secondary to the light, or to write on film. Uh, DeForest uh, writes a letter, and I just underlined Professor Pupin. Professor Pupin was in here Monday. The famous inventor, Michael Pupin, was in DeForest's lab. I mean, you know, you just drop those names like, oh, yeah, Armstrong was here. Well, he wouldn't be Armstrong. <laughs> but, but, but anyhow, um, th this was the kind of thing that happened probably two or three times a week between 1920 and 1925 or so. They exchanged letters, some rancorous, um, some were friendly, but they always went back to science. They always ended up dialoguing for a long time about science. Uh, the noise is due to the graininess of the emulsion. I am taking the matter up with Dr. Mees of the Eastman Kodak Company to see if he can produce an emulsion which contains only very fine silver bromide. These guys were chemistry, they were physics, they were optics, uh, electricity. I mean, it must have been very exciting back then because, you know, we know way too much today. They were just discovering these things, how to write sound on film. Um, anyway, there are plenty of, um, of, of uh, correspondence and letters going back and forth. Um, what, uh, what Case really disliked more than anything else was that DeForest was getting all the credit for the work, right? Um, Case wanted some credit. He wanted, you know, here's DeForest, his picture on everything, all the photo film advertising. Case was a small town guy, right, at Auburn, New York. And the reason, here's the reason. DeForest was exhibiting photo films at the Rivoli Theater in New York, and he asked, uh, the question was asked, can we get Case's name up on the marquee or actually even on the title of the film. And here's what Hugo Riesenfeld, the managing director, said, and this, this explains everything. You surely understand that all of our publicity has been exclusively DeForest, which we consider a valuable asset on account of the great popularity of the radio. So here it was. DeForest um, was famous for two things in his life, radio and, and briefly for sound film. But this is what they were doing. They were using DeForest's name on the marquee, a DeForest system, because he was uh, famous for radio. I want to show you the first of two photo films. Um, this one does have DeForest case patents on it. This is President Coolidge talking about the deficit in 1924, more or less. Oh, they had them back then, too. Yeah, we had them. every ounce of its energy to restore itself. The costs of government and are all assessed upon the people. This means that the farmer is doomed to provide a certain amount of money out of the sale of his produce 
Ship it here. Our Lord, the price to pay his taxes. The manufacturer, the professional man, the clerk must do the same from their income. The wage earner, often at a higher rate when compared with his earning, makes his contribution perhaps not directly. But He's talking about basic economics 101. The advance cost of everything he buys. Okay, so I'm going to stop it, of course, because it's uh, not important. Uh, but I want to do another one because Case, meanwhile, Case was developing a sound-on-film system, which he thought was a new and useful improvement upon De Forest, just in, just in very small ways. And he began making some films, too, including this one, which is, um, which is The Talking Duck, Gus Fisher and The Talking Duck. I've seen this. It's very funny. Um, Okay. Again, these were not films. These were recordings of existing media, like, for example, vaudeville acts, musical groups, bands, comedians. Everything was just the fixed camera on the presidium of the theater, right? And uh, a microphone somewhere, close as possible. Disgusting, actually. Who's seen the duck to make him uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> anyway, uh, let me just say that if you go to the DeForest Facebook page, if you just type in the Google window, Lee DeForest or DeForest King of Radio TV or something, you'll get the Facebook page. I have about oh, maybe 10 of his phono films on there right now um, in, in fairly you know, big screen, um, so, so take a look at it. Okay, well... Uh, as I say, Case, being a smart guy, you know, Harvard Law, right, and, and, and Yale, he, he thought he had a system that was good. Um, he patented it, but not until 1925. De Forest had already made the patents, but Case tried to make his just different enough. But when he sold it to William Fox to create Movie Tone, um, De Forest immediately sued. This thing was in court for three years, maybe. Uh, what really ended up in the end was that uh, neither party won. It was settled out of court. Fox Films gave uh, DeForest uh, a fairly decent sum. They all walked away. By then there were processes and sound movies being made every day. See, Hollywood didn't care. They could spend all the money in the world to solve these problems. But, and in the Case Museum there are these big displays for court, these exhibits, these old dusty books. And what DeForest had done was cut out pictures from the uh, Ernst Rumor book from the turn of the century, um, and both, both DeForest and Case said, well, you know, no one can really own this. You know, one saying, well, you can't really own this. It goes back to, to Bell's photophone and uh, Rumor's uh, photograph phone. You can't own this. And DeForest or Case would say the same thing. Well, you can't own it either. So it became kind of, um, you know, it didn't happen. So, so anyway, it, it, was, it was a good idea, but it did not happen. Um, Warner Brothers jazz singer in 1927, DeForest writes in his diary, Last night, the flashing posters of Vitaphone gave me first a shock, like a blow. Why and how have I wasted the past two years? Well, the reason, and Vitaphone was a phonograph, a synchronized 16-inch, 33 and a third phonograph, but, but because electrical recording had happened by 1925, the phonograph quality was quite high, higher than the sound on film processes. And again, the, the studios don't care because they did their mastering on these things and, and went from disc to disc to disc, you know, and mixed discs to disc. I mean, it must have been terribly noisy, but they knew what they were doing. But the real key, why do movies work? Well, Al Jolson had a big star. Same reason movies work today, a big star. The audience in the theater does not care whether the sound is on the film or on a phonograph record. Uh, they just don't care because basically um, it's what's on the screen. And the jazz singer was a transition picture. If you've seen it, there were a couple of scenes where Al Jolson sings to his mother or sings to an audience, um, and and this uh, th this is synchronized. The um, that's, that's probably my phone. But the um, the um, most of it was was uh, subtitles. So, anyway, transition. Okay, let's, let's wrap this up. The DeForest legacy. DeForest began telling his story as early as 1924. He told his story over and over and over again. He, uh, th there was a serialized uh, in, in radio news 
uh, maybe five or six or seven issues, seven or eight parts of the DeForest story. Uh, in 1930, he met Georgiette Carneal, who did uh, uh, Conqueror of Space or something like that, uh, because he called his triode space telegraphy, right? Um, uh, and, and she wrote a book. Both of these said, uh, with the cooperation and permission of DeForest. So this was the authorized. These were authorized. Father of Radio, DeForest um, autobiography in 1950. Again, what DeForest wants you to wants you to believe. Um, you know, there were there were some. I mean, I, I mean, I've read them all, and they all have um, they all have their their purposes. Um, we had this bus downstairs. DeForest. Uh, was the kind of guy who he wanted to be loved. I mean, I think more than money, he wanted to be adored by everyone. And he was popular. I mean, people did know about him, um, even though he believes he was, uh, he believed for years that he was, uh, was screwed out of the sound on film process. He did receive an Oscar for it in 1959 to lead a forest bringing sound to the motion picture. So he was, in a sense, vindicated by the Hollywood community. Um, and also in the very first group in 1961 of the uh, Hollywood Walk of Fame stars at Hollywood and Vine, right there in the shadow of Capitol Records, uh, is the DeForest sign um, star for motion pictures. Famous guy. Um, if you're into movies, just coincidentally, I'll, I'll be done, just coincidentally, uh, there are two current films um, nominated for Oscars. Uh, Hugo is early silent film history, an excellent film, as is The Artist, a very cute film which is about the transition. And I do the parallel history of film in the, in the DeForest book. So see those movies, and um, that, that's, uh, any, any questions? I'm done, thank you. Uh, did, did DeForest ever make <laughs> No, uh, they, DeForest uh, never, apparently never met Harold in person, but they exchanged one letter. Um, Harold basically said, uh, uh, I was uh, broadcasting to your booth in 1915 at the PPIE from San Jose, and, uh, and you know, I, what would you say I was the first broadcaster? He was, he was trying to cement his legacy, DeForest. And DeForest was not the first broadcaster. He started a radio station, which is significant, and student radio station, college radio. Like I, uh, how did all these uh, primary sources end up in San Jose? Well, uh, of the three different ar archives, the reason the primary sources are in San Jose uh, can be traced back to Federal Telegraph because also, along with DeForest, Doug Parham worked at Federal Telegraph as a mechanician. And, and Parham had a home museum in San Jose throughout the 1940s and 50s before it went to Foothill. Um, and so uh, DeForest, um, DeForest's wife, who was still alive because she was much younger, his fourth wife, uh, heard about the Parham Foundation, I think from Cy Stein, the president of Parham at the time. Um, she was going to throw all this stuff out, and so uh, apparently um, she gave it to the Parham Foundation. That, that's a tenuous connection to Parham. We have photographs, there's one in the book, of Parham and DeForest together, so that's probably the same as that. Plus, he must have felt really good. He loved California, even though his final 30 years were spent in Los Angeles. Uh, he, he loved and talked about his his days of hiking in the in the hills above uh, Stanford and all of that. So he loved to say, uh, oh, "Yes, sir." <coughs> Edison did something on the film. No? Edison. Uh, Thomas Edison. 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 What, what was the relation? What Edison did was was help us make the transition from wet plate photography into motion picture. Uh, Eastman developed a flexible film base for a 35 millimeter. One of those, uh, you know, you push the button, send it in, and they develop it. And so Edison heard about it, or actually uh, there's some argument there because uh, Edison's uh, pal Dixon, who worked for him, claimed he did it. Uh, but he asked Eastman Kodak to make him a longer roll of it, which he used in his, uh, his Kineta phone, his peep show thing that he used, Kinetoscope or Kineta phone. Uh, and, um, and so, but these were silent, 30 second silent film loops. So what it took, uh, to make the transition, again, and this story I write about in the book, that's why the book is so big, is, you know, we went from wet plate photography to flexible film base. We also developed a start and stop action to be able to pull down the film, open the shutter, shine the light through, pull it down, stop it, shine the light through, about 24 times a second. Uh, and, of course, um, Edison's uh, light bulb was not quite good enough, but they used arc lights in the early projectors. Uh, but it was dim. This is why he used the peep show format um, in, in the very beginning. And all this was happening back in the 1880s and 
1890s. So I guess you could say Edison was, man, he's very important. Matter of fact, Edison owned film uh, in, until 1905, 1906 when the Film Trust came in. They had to buy his patents. You know, he was kind of a ruthless guy in some ways. What um, was what was Western Electric's involvement in in um, in producing movies? Because well, they were a lot the, of the thirties and forties movies you see at the end, you see like sound by Western recording. Electric. Yeah. Well, Western Electric started. They they developed the Vitaphone process because they developed uh, electrical playback and recording of records, which changed everything from the, the horns and the. Uh, groups yelling into the speaker. Uh, that was Western Electric. They developed the first Vitaphone system. They, they developed the sound on film system. They were the manufacturing arm of AT&T, of a phone company. Um, they, they were like the science trust, like Xerox Park or something like that. <coughs> I think if anybody knows right. more. Does that sound right? And then they developed what's called the sound recorder yeah. with the variable split and variable slip to put the sound on the film. How is that different, though, than what he was talking about, the variable thing on the side of the sound? Uh, this is, the forest is variable density, dark to light. Like AM and FM, so talking about sounds like that. No, just a different way to expose the... back on the same projection. Just a different way to expose the emulsion on the film at the soundtrack area. This is variable density, and the Western Electric System was variable area. Oh, oh, which, oh, which is a galvanometer magnetically moving to write the soundtrack in a, in a mirror, like, the light reflected on the mirror. I, I can, I, more I like think I have slide. drawings in the book, actually. <laughs> more like that slide you showed earlier with the two examples, and it was that kind of a... Yeah, it sort of looked like yeah, that. Was, yeah, sort that was what it looked like, and, and everything became variable area by the 1930s. Western Electric did amplifiers, they did microphones, they did loudspeakers, I mean, they were big. Before RCA? Um, well, RCA was, was, was started in 1920 as a consortium, which included AT&T, which must have included Western Electric, because under the RCA agreements, it was Western Electric, right, that was allowed to sell transmitters for broadcasting. Uh, Western Electric was an arm of AT&T. Yes. They were, the, they were the inventing, they were like the science of That's right. We have two more minutes, you said? Yeah, four. Four, four, four. four minutes. Uh, how does the forest uh, fit into progression uh, to the triode and the pentode, does he inspire later developers, uh, later inventors of amplification? Yeah, I think other people did a lot more with it. I mean, I think DeForest started out with a triode, which he thought had to have gas inside to make it make it work. And of course, um, they realized it would have been a very noisy amplifier, and it was. And so other inventors, um, and the phone, when the phone company bought it, they immediately started with their high-priced scientists spending full time on it. The forest just split it from one thing to the other. He said, well, here it is. Uh, you want to buy it? He, he met, ended up selling three or four different sets of rights to the uh, to AT&T. Um, so, and the forest ended up where his only rights until early 20s was uh, as uh, to sell the amateurs. That was, that was the license he had. How well off was he in the last years of his life? Last years of his life, how well off was he? Um, he was not that well off. I saw his house in the Hollywood Hills. It's still there. <coughs> um, I mean, somebody else lives in it. Mm -hmm. um, it was fancy for the time, but not a mansion by any means. Uh, I mean, he was he comfortable, a, wasn't he? He was comfortable because he did get royalties. He, he actually got royalties from what's now DeVry University, but it was uh, uh, called the DeForest Radio Institute in Chicago. He was. He was, for his name, I mean, he got stuff. He uh, sold his uh, tube business to uh, RCA, I believe, in the middle 1930s. Got lots of money for that. Um, you know, he was, he, he, it was claimed he died with just a few dollars in his pocket. <coughs> but he had stuff. He, he had nice money. What did he think of Armstrong? Armstrong always said he didn't really understand how any of his stuff worked. And, and I, I go into great detail about that in the, in, in the book. He hated Armstrong in, in a very unreasonable way. He hated, hated, hated him, you know. Um, and they, they went to court many times. In the end, the, the judge in the middle 1930s uh, said, I'm not going to take any more testimony. I'm, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. What happened years ago is just going to stay what happened in the 20s at, at the second or third trial. And so they, he did rule in favor of DeForest. 
um, Armstrong and DeForest wrote letters back and forth and letters to Congress in the late 30s and early 40s. Um, you know, DeForest uh, and others, Dumont, for example, claiming that Armstrong's FM was not really his invention, but it was something that happened around the turn of the century. So, I mean, every inventor, no inventors were saints, right? I mean, if you can name one, he probably doesn't have very many patents or inventions. They all borrowed and tried to improve upon the work of those who came before. I've watched the, uh, as a, I think it's the Empire of the Air. Sure. And does he still have family, or is there family existing still? There, there, he had uh, th uh, three daughters, two by his third wife and one by his second wife, I guess. Um, there's one, and the one was born in 1925, is in her 80s. Um, she, somebody, uh, I guess her, her daughter, wrote a, an email to me, um, and, and I, I wanted to get in a conversation. I said, well, you know, where is she? I'll come and, um, it was... Um, uh, the DeForest child. Uh, she speaks well of him, but she's very private and didn't want to really talk to him. So do they own any of his patents or royalties or anything like that? Or? Uh, I think most of those expired in his lifetime. Patents hmm. didn't last very long. Um, you know, the Audion patents, um, you know, started to expire in the 20s. I guess I, I, guess I have to go. How much more? Just wrap Three seconds. Wrap it up. What did he do during World War II? World War II, uh, he, he did have some patents on some radar kinds of things. Um, he was too old for the war, just like he was too old for World War I. So, uh, he did look to be an, uh, an old guy. But in, in World War I uh, and II, he um, spoke and talked about it, and he was a patriot. Um, but I, I, guess I, I guess I have to stop this No, there's no reason to stop. Go ahead. No, 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 I'm running out of tape. Oh, oh okay. okay. Out of tape. Okay, sure. Well, I'll be happy to answer. Out of tape. No, no, questions. but i got, I got to edit this thing. Any questions? I will answer it for you. Yeah, we'll answer after we stop recording, but just do a, just do a close. And then we'll wrap it up, then more questions. Okay, wrapping it up. Okay, uh, I hope you will um, buy my book, uh, Lead the Force, <laughs> radio, television, and film. Um, it, it, it is uh, an honest book. It, it talks about good and bad in the forest and hopefully, hopefully exposes him uh, in, 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 a, in a perspective that uh, you can live with. Um, you know, I think, I think that Empire of the Air was a little anti the forest, wouldn't you say? Um, but I'm, I'm not really with the man. It's, it's available uh, downstairs. We're, we're actually going to be uh, that. selling it uh, anywhere. Uh, I mean, just you know, Amazon, any place. BarnesandNoble.com. There are no bookstores anymore. Okay, thank you.